So this is my segue to Bob Sanford, who's going to be our keynote speaker. And Bob, you want to come up with I just kind of transition here? Because uh, you're going to self-introduce yourself, right, Bob? Because all I'm going to call you is the water champion and the, the prolific author. And me, Bob has generated a number of sound bites. And I like this one because it kind of captures what we're trying to do in terms of we had no idea until how recently, how much we rely on the stability to hide that site in our day-to-day -day lives. And just before I shut my microphone off, uh, Bob. So Bob is going to kind of give me that global picture. And then we're going to just transition into a, uh, a town hall segment where between Bob and myself, we'll get you talking. Bob, it's all yours. I will give you the remote. <laughs> and it's not going to go on. Let's make sure it goes on. Sorry, Well, first of all, I want to thank you for your, your kind introduction. I also want to thank Ken Vanderzulik and, and, and Kim for um, the opportunity to speak at this this very important and I think very timely symposium. I also want to offer special thanks to uh, all who were at dinner last night for their absolutely thunderous conversation. And uh, I have to tell you that Ted's got some great stories. I'm sure many of you know him, know that. But what I found last night was that there's a lot of really good things happening here. And I was grateful for the opportunity to learn about it. And for those who don't know me, please allow me to explain that my work with the United Nations is to build a better bridge between science and public understanding and public action on water and climate issues in Canada and elsewhere in the world. And one of the principal <coughs> roles of our initiative is to bring national and international example to bear on Canadian water and water-related climate concerns. And my principal focus is on water security. As everyone in this gathering knows, and Kim certainly covered this in his introduction, water security used to mean having and being able to reliably provide adequate water of the right quality where and when you need it for all purposes, especially agriculture, but also for purposes related to sustainable, natural, biodiversity-based earth system function. And it used to mean ensuring that your use and management of water in the region in which you live does not in any way negatively affect the water security of regions up or downstream from you now or in the future. <clears throat> and what's interesting is water security certainly still means all of these things, but changing circumstances now mean that there is an additional element of water security that must now be considered. And over the last decade, water security has come to mean being able to achieve these goals not just in the face of growing population but also in the face of new circumstances created by the acceleration of the global hydrologic cycle. And what I'm describing here is what I call the storm after the calm, after a period of relative hydroclimatic stability during which we created most of our built environment. Step-like changes to our hydroclimatic circumstances are demanding that we redefine what development and sustainability mean, not just in Canada, but globally. And this, in turn, demands that we reassess personal and collective vulnerability. We reassess accountability and liability and adapt quickly to changing circumstances if we want to sustain our prosperity in the face of altered hydrometeorological circumstances. So what such reassessment reveals is what Kim was implying, certainly, and has said directly, that water security, food security, and climate security are inseparable. One is implicit in the other. It could even be said that they're the same thing. And as everyone in this room knows, water, food, and climate security are critical elements of sustainability. Without stable water and climate regimes, sustainability will forever remain a moving target. But if you're at the symposium, you also know that flood resilience, like drought resilience, is is very much an element of the larger water security ideal. And this makes integrated management, especially in upland regions, a critical factor in any water and climate security formula. Now, these are, in effect, 
old ideas made new again in the context of the emerging politics of hydrometeorological change. And in order to see where all this might be taking us, it might be helpful to examine how these politics have emerged and, and how they've evolved. Well, not related directly to climate change, the issue of urban flood resilience appeared on our radar just after the United Nations Water for Life Decade was initiated 10 years ago. And what happened in New Orleans just simply couldn't be ignored. And while the media and most public attention focused on the failure of the Federal Emergency Management Agency and, and perhaps the culpability of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the disaster, what we looked at were the broader implications of what happened there. We examined the implications of a projected increase in the vulnerability of big cities to longer, more frequent, and ever more intense flooding events that were expected to occur over time as a consequence of human-caused changes in the composition of the global atmosphere. And what we found was that while the initial focus always seemed to be on the huge cost of repairing damages to cities like New Orleans, the real cost, the deeper cost that went largely uncalculated was the permanent physical and psychological impact on those who survived Katrina and its aftermath. And really, it's taken a, a decade to sort out just how serious this damage was and remains. Now, if you were interested in the larger issues related to sustainability of our society and the change of climate, and haven't already read this book, I really urge you to do so. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Sections of New Orleans were uninhabitable for weeks, and the medical center of which Sherry Fink worked was an island in the center of the flood zone. And when the power went out in the city, backup generators could not keep the air conditioning functioning and still be relied upon to supply light. It was, again, partly because they were situated, as was noted in the introduction, in the wrong place in the building. And what happened was that helicopters could only take one or two of the 2,000 people that needed to be evacuated at a time. And the ethical question became, who do you evacuate first? How do you prioritize who lives and who dies? And in the aftermath, some doctors and nurses were charged with murder. And what this example demonstrates is that the moral jeopardy that arises in the aftermath of extreme weather events is similar to that which arises in the war zone when it becomes impossible to adhere to established moral values. And that is the larger terrain we are entering with respect to extreme weather events. Katrina was followed by a nearly a decade of foreshadowing of the flooding disaster we later, later experienced in southern Alberta. Uh, I should point out that uh, there was flooding in Alberta in 2005, followed by flooding widely through Europe and the Northern Hemisphere almost every year following. And then in 2010, we saw something we would never seen before. We began to see mega floods, events that occurred in Australia and Pakistan, so large they've never been experienced before. We now know that these are tied to uh, an atmospheric phenomenon called atmospheric rivers, high altitude avenues of water vapor that can carry 14 times the average flow of the Mississippi River. And then we saw a mega flood on the Canadian prairies in 2011. It was clear to us that there's something going on out there, that the hydrologic order was changing. But we didn't have the evidence to prove it. And then suddenly we had it. In the fall of 2011, John Pomeroy and researchers at the University of Saskatchewan showed evidence that was confirmed by a major report almost simultaneously re released by the National Research Council in the United States that proved that the global hydrologic cycle was in fact accelerating. The, the report confirmed how serious the loss of hydrologic stability could be in North America and around the world if current trends persist. And the things that are quite interesting about this report is their analysis include consensus on the fact that anthropogenic land cover changes, such as deforestation, wetland destruction, urban expansion, dams, irrigation projects, and other water division, uh, diversions actually have a significant impact on the duration 
and intensity of both floods and droughts. And the report concludes that continuing to use the assumption of stationarity in designing water management systems is in fact no longer practical or even defensible. In other words, the old math and the old methods no longer work. And the key thing to note here is that continuing to use them will in time become legally indefensible. The significance, I think, of the loss of hydrologic stability in our society is only slowly beginning to sink in. My experience right now is that globally, action in support of true sustainability and resilience in the face of hydroclimatic change is moving along at five kilometers an hour, while the problem is moving at 19 kilometers an hour and accelerating. So we need to catch up while we can and I think this is what this symposium is about. And what we're seeing, and this was brought out very clearly in the introduction, is that because of the increasing number and growing costs of climate-related disasters, more and more people and more and more average citizens are becoming concerned about resilience. And this growing interest coincides with a critical time in the global dialogue concerning the sustainability of human presence on this planet. We face a number of cumulative and compounding human effects that at present continue to make sustainability a moving target. We need to stabilize these effects if we want, don't want adaptation and resilience to constantly be beyond our grasp. And the problem, as all of you know, is that our numbers, needs, and activities globally are such that we've begun to undermine the planetary conditions upon which we depend for the stability of environment and economy that are the foundation of our prosperity. And nine Earth system boundaries have been identified as critical in that the extent to which they are not crossed mark the safe zone for how we can live together on this planet. And of these boundaries, we've already crossed four. And careful examination of how our hydrology is changing and how little the public understands the significance of these changes suggests that if we want to create resilience, we may have to reframe our situation. And one way our current situation is being reframed is through the notion that we've entered a new geological era in which human activities rival the processes of nature itself. So what is this new geological impact? And how is it different from the geological periods of the past? This new geological era is being called the Anthropocene. And unlike earlier epochs in the Earth's history, which were brought about by meteorite strikes and other geological events which resulted in mass extinction, this epoch is marked by our overall impact on the Earth's system. And I think it's really important to note that climate disruption is only one of the Earth's system boundaries that mark the safe zone we must stay within if we want a prosperous future. But it's important to note also that by virtue of our numbers, and our activities, we've altered the global carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles. We're causing changes in the chemistry, salinity, and temperature of our oceans, and changing the composition of our atmosphere. And changes in this atmosphere, and tandem with land use changes, and our growing water demands have altered the global water cycle. And the cumulative measure of the extent to which we've crossed these boundaries is the rate of biodiversity loss. So what this means is that we've entered an era in which we can no longer count on self-willed, self-regulated natural landscapes to absorb human impacts on our system function. Whether we like it or not, we have to assume responsibility for staying within Earth system boundaries. Now, this is not a matter that people want to talk about, and this is a problem. The way things are going now, we're not going to be able to afford cost to our economy of ignoring these hydrometeorological circumstances. So, so what this means for all of us in this room who are serious about these matters is that we have to continually rethink sustainability. And despite inherent tensions among them, the next iteration of global sustainable development goals and targets must create a safe operating space within both Earth system and social boundaries. And in responding to the urgency and opportunity of finally getting sustainability right, the United Nations in September announced a new framework for global action. 
The 2030 Transforming Our World Agenda promises to be the most comprehensive and inclusive effort to positively change the world in all of human history. This may well be the most important thing we've done for ourselves and our planet. It's, it's really nothing less than a charter for people and planet for the 21st century. And what the 2030 Transforming Our World Agenda does is it raises the ceiling globally on sustainability. And as such, I think it's as important as pending climate negotiations in Paris in that it deals with damage we're doing to other elements of the Earth system that are exacerbating and being exacerbated by climate change. And this agenda is constructed around five things, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. And the interesting thing about it is that it applies equally to the developed world as it does to developing nations. And our hope for achieving sustainable development globally resides in the balance between urgency, capacity, and will to succeed as demonstrated by each and every member state in making action possible at the national level. So it's at the national level that these goals must be met. And the degree of our success will depend on governance. And by governance, I mean the way in which authority is organized and executed in a society. And this, of course, will be a topic that we'll be covering later today. Translating the global sustainable development agenda to action at the national level is the greatest challenge we presently face in dealing with the degree of hydroclimatic change we're beginning to witness on a planetary scale. So in other words, we won't achieve the goal of sustainable human existence at any meaningful level of prosperity unless we all take common global goals seriously and implement meaningful and measurable actions at the national level in every country in the world. So this means that there can't be any laggards in the developed world, and it also means that the world cannot afford to leave anyone behind. So you might ask, well, where does Canada fit in all this? Well, you fit within Canada. But the Canadian situation just changed. And often in social movements, as everyone in this room knows, timing is everything. The world is about to reach out and steady itself. Now is the time. There's still room to move, but we have to room that move now while that room still exists. And one of the ways, and we talked at length about this last night, one of the ways to re-energize the conversation about sustainable development and humanity's need for resilience in the face of rapid change is to talk about something that none of us can live without, water. And of the nine Earth system boundaries which we dare not cross, water plays a role, a significant role in seven. There are 17 goals in the Transforming Our World agenda. Goal six pertains specifically to water. What the world learned from the Millennium Development Goals is that we need to better address the multiple roles water plays in establishing, maintaining, and improving the human condition. So creating a systems approach to managing water has to be seen as synonymous with sustainability, the sine qua non of resilience. Then there is the not insignificant matter of cities. Some 92% of the population growth, which has brought the last 1.2 billion people into the world, has occurred in cities. And some 60% of the urban space required to accommodate future populations has yet to be built. Sustainable Development Goal 11 aims to make the world's cities and settlements inclusive, resilient, and sustainable. And the vision is that by 2030, sustainable, resilient cities will significantly reduce the number of deaths and the economic and psychological effects caused by disasters, including water-related catastrophes. Now, that target is that as early as five years from now, we'll have substantially increased the number of cities and human settlements adopting and implementing plans to mitigate and adapt to climate change and to enhance resilience to disasters. Five years, that's not much time. And by 2030, we also want to reduce the adverse per capita impact of cities on surrounding regions. Now, I spend a lot of time traveling in rural Canada, as many of you do. And I can say with considerable confidence 
that most city dwellers would be very surprised with what's going on out there in the name of urban prosperity. Now, I realize some good work has been done in this province, but I am of the view that the concept of sustainable development has been badly abused in Canada because it's lacked clear, commonly held definition and time frames. The concept of sustainable development has become like elevator music to which we all march down the road together thinking we're actually doing something that's not being mocked and overshadowed by population and economic growth. And it all sounds terrific until someone starts asking divisive political questions about where we're actually going. And what's important here is that deteriorating Earth system function makes it clear that if we don't take sustainable development seriously, we could find ourselves on a planet whose conditions are hostile to human habitability as we know it today. So we're now faced with the realization that if we are to achieve any meaningful level of sustainable development, all development has to not only be sustainable, but restorative. We need to recognize that no city can become truly sustainable and resilient unless the landscapes around it are managed sustainably also. This means we have to master basin scale integrated water resources management, and it also means that we have to stop ignoring the impacts of industrial agriculture. And it's widely held that agriculture is in a state of difficulty that cannot be sustained indefinitely. And at the risk of disagreeing with one another, we have to talk about these things. This should not be an us versus them proposition. We cannot let agriculture fail. Nobody disputes that. If agriculture fails, our cities will fail. But we also need clean water and protection from flooding. And the fact remains that if we want flood resilient cities or uh, flood resilience anywhere else, we not only need to change some of our agricultural practices, but perhaps some of our principles. And in this, there's an opportunity to make agriculture restorative as well as productive. And what I have been continually maintaining is that we may need another agricultural revolution. And I'm not talking about a violent revolution here. I'm talking about one in which society agrees to pay farmers and producers not just for crops, but for perpetuating critical earth system function over the overexpanding lands and now under agriculture globally. And the concepts of agriculture, agroecology, have to be part of a transformation that we need to occur soon. The key thing we have to recognize, it has to be a partnership and it has to be profitable for producers. We know what direction to head globally and rebuilding soils as a means of enhancing natural processes of water purification is now seen as, as, as simply smart urban planning. That's why 200 cities in 29 countries have forgone building new water treatment plants and instead invested in watershed restoration that prevents pollution downstream while at the same time enhancing flood protection. But soil does something else besides grow forests, supply food, and absorb and purify water. It stores carbon. Soils contain three times the amount of carbon stored in vegetation and twice the amount of carbon stored in the atmosphere. And it's now estimated that we've already lost as much as 80 billion tons of carbon from our soils through inappropriate agricultural practices and short-sighted land use. Current IPCC warming projections based on the effect of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere resulting from greenhouse emissions do not as yet take the effects of warming of the world's soil into full consideration. It appears, however, that these feedbacks could be absolutely substantial. There, there's about four times more carbon sequestered in the top 20 centimeters of our planet's atmosphere as there is now in the atmosphere. So think about this. A warming of only two degrees Celsius could cause 25% of the soil carbon in topsoil to burn off as carbon dioxide. That amount would be equal to the amount of carbon already in the atmosphere as a result of burning fossil fuels. So in other words, if we warm the world's soils by 2 degrees Celsius, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can double from its present 400 parts per million to 800 parts per million. And that would change everything. So getting and keeping carbon in the soil may be one of humanity's most important priorities. 
So if we are to be sustainable as a society, agriculture must be restored in terms of carbon and regenerative in terms of earth system function, and we have to pay for that. So we need smart agriculture, which is to say agriculture which seeks to increase productivity while at the same time reducing greenhouse emissions and increasing resilience. And what we may need is a green revolution, this time focused as the last brilliant revolution was on food production, this time on the integration of water, food, and climate security. And I believe that Canada can be a leader in that revolution. In the context of sustainability, I want to say that I'm constantly reminded of the Red Queen effect in biology, which is used as a metaphor for the evolutionary principle that regardless of how well a species adapts to its current environment, it's got to keep up with its competitors and enemies that are already evolving. And the Red Queen effect is an allusion to Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, where Alice is confronted with the fact that in Wonderland, you have to run twice as fast to keep in the same place. And I think the Red Queen effect very much describes our current sustainability challenge. And it will certainly describe our sustainability challenge as hydroclimatic change accelerates as we project it to do in the coming years. Do nothing and you fall behind. Or you run hard and just stay where you are. Or you run really hard and you catch up with and get ahead of our sustainability challenges. In conclusion, I wish to point out that this is definitely not the end of the world. And there's no point for gloom and doom. It's not helpful. There's no need for us to throw up our hands in helpless despair. None of us should feel compelled to curl up in a ball on the floor. Because what you see is that declining our system function gives the concept of true sustainability new force. And as Kim said in his introduction, each generation adjusts its environmental baseline to new levels, and sometimes higher and sometimes lower. So we need to turn the clock back and restore systems. And I believe that out of sheer necessity, we will adapt and become more resilient as a society. And we should never lose back the sight of the fact that potential also exists to create a better world. And that better world starts with water. And I'm honored and privileged to work with people of your caliber to help create that world. Thank you very much. Thank you.